brena kakara to sokolo de brena kakara da bazokolo de brena katenenge egele de baba babara katuse kele de brena kakoro do sikile de brena nengra gado jokolo do brena kaka agabazo kolo do brena kakoro do sokele de brena kakoro do sokolo do brena katananga egebo jakala de babra gada sokole de brena katunenge egeba jokolo do babra gado sokele de brena kakari de gidia egebo jakele de brega egele ne maso toni gege ele manongo lodo bianaga agali bajo kolo do baboro agele ne mambo rodo sukele de brina kakolo do boro kuto sekele de bambrege ne mao tongo egebo jakele de brina hata thank you father praise you father in the name of jesus Heavenly Father, we rejoice again that tonight we have the privilege to learn, to be equipped, to grow in knowledge, to grow in grace and abound in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the knowledge of all that the Lord Jesus will have us do in this generation to impact and affect people and bring the manifestation of God's glory in this last days like never before. So I pray that everybody connected to this service, revelation knowledge is gifted to you. The eyes of your understanding flooded with light. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Body and sign yokes are destroyed. We overthrow every networking of darkness and we decree that the entrance of God's word will bring light and understanding. And in the name of Jesus, we declare that this evening, by the end of this service, we'll all be the better for it. So we give you praise, glory, and honor for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name and every believer says, is a powerful amen. amen praise god let's release our feet together as you say these words i am born of god i am born of the world the word of god is my nature i do not struggle to do the word i do the word naturally therefore today i will understand the word of his grace i will be built up by the end of this service i will never be the same never ever be the same again in Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're so glad to have all of you, social media community, brethren, family, friends on social media. What an honor to have all of you connected tonight. I want, also want to welcome the entire Aquaibom State community. Connected by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, you know, your FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. We're so glad to welcome all of you to the service tonight. Hey guys, do me a favor, call a friend, a loved one, a family member, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our social media community, like you've always done, we are co-laborers together in the advancement of God's kingdom on the earth. Help me share the video, tag some people create watch parties drop the video on as many groups as possible on your page and join as many groups as possible to get the videos in there let's lighten the dark places of the earth also put them on monogram telegram and whatsapp groups but we're so glad to welcome all of you tonight to this great adventure in the word of his grace all our house centers in Aquaibom, what a joy to have all of you this evening in the service. And of course, all our campuses around the world and Bible study centers. Hey guys, get ready. It's going to be exciting as we continue in our training, evangelism and discipleship week. And it's been wonderful just sharing fellowship every day. Grace and peace is being multiplied as we continue to study. All right, grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get in the word tonight. Praise God. All right, we're still examining the foundation and culture of discipleship. The foundation and culture of discipleship. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. Put it up for me. Matthew 28, verse number 18. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. All right. Silas, I, I mean, Ernest, I need you to go to that studio quickly and make sure somebody serious is on that system for me this evening. I really don't want anybody to play with, with me this evening. All right. Matthew 28. Let me check it up in my own Bible quickly. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. The Bible tells us, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
and lo, I am with you always, unto the end of the world. Amen. So we've been looking at the concept of discipleship and we've established that Jesus always taught the scriptures beginning at Moses and all the prophets. All right. All of the time, he began from Moses, the prophet, and the Psalms. In Luke chapter 24, verse 25 to 27, when Jesus rose from the dead on the way to Emmaus, and he met those disciples of his, and he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory, and beginning at Moses, and all the prophets? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We've established that the Bible is a Christocentric material that carries with it a Christocentric message. That the message of the scriptures is a singular revelation of the Christ. A singular revelation of the Christ. The things concerning himself. In John chapter 5 verse 39, Jesus speaking to the Jews said to them, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. So the scriptures carries with it the testimony of the Christ. It's a singular revelation meaning that the scriptures must be examined in the light of Christ. The book of First John chapter 5 verse 20, the Bible tells us that and we know that the son of God is come and had given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Our understanding is via the binoculars of Christ. The son of God is come and had given us an understanding. So our understanding of God is in the man Christ Jesus. Praise God. So when he will teach discipleship, it will be the same concept, bringing it from the Old Testament. Look at the book of Psalms. We looked at the man David and I want us to examine him a bit again today. The book of Psalms chapter 78 verse 70. Psalm 78 verse 70. He chose David also, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. Put, verse 71. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. 72. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. They, now we have found out that David actually fed the, those sheep according to the integrity of his heart. The word integrity there is the word tom in the Hebrew. T-O-M. The word tom means innocence. Innocence or sincerity. It doesn't mean that David is a moral giant. But he is a sincere guy. Very sincere giant. That is, he is not a schemer. That word Tom is from the word Tama in the Greek. I mean in the Hebrew. It means to spend yourself for others. To spend yourself for others. So to be a good shepherd, you must be sincere. One that is innocent. Sincere and innocent person. Don't be the one who suspects this or suspects that. You must be innocent, sincere. You must trust. All right, some people are always suspecting. And that's the reason why you have suspicion on your mind. Because you yourself have a bad character. Because to the pure, all things are pure. Remember, just before I proceed with David, you learn pastoring from your pastor. You learn teaching from your pastor. You learn ministry from your leader. Look at John chapter 21 verse 15. John chapter 21 verse number 15. <clears throat> so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my lambs. So he said to him again the second time, 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my lambs. Now Jesus is speaking to Peter. Simon, lovest thou me more than these? The guy says yes. Then he tells him, Feed my lambs. Then he tells him, Feed my sheep. Then he tells him, Feed my sheep. Of course, I have told you that the word feed my lambs is bosco ania. Bosco ania in the Greek. Feed my lambs. And then the word feed my sheep is pio, piomano probata. Piomano probata. One is give food and tend my lambs. Give them food and tend them or nourish them. Then the second one is rule them and govern them. Where you have the word shepherd. All right, and we said that word shepherd is a narrative from the Old Testament. And that's why we're examining Brother David as a shepherd who was exemplary in the Old Testament. Now, the shepherd gives himself. He is spent to do the job with the integrity of his heart. Let me tell you this. It counts for a lot that God wants to see your heart having that integrity. It counts for a lot that God wants to see your heart having that integrity. You don't have to get everything right. I don't know anybody who gets everything right. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for years. I've made mistakes in my pastoring. I've made mistakes in my life. All right? So you don't have to get everything right because nobody does. That's why Jesus is that example for us. So the integrity of the heart, that's the number one, integrity of the heart. Secondly, he guided them. That word is the same word, naka, in the Greek, I mean in the Hebrew, naka, N-A-C-H-A-H, N-A-C-H-A-H, naka. Same word used for Moses over Israel. So what Moses did to Israel is what David is doing. And I taught you that Israel wasn't meant to have a king. But they were meant to have a servant leader like Moses. Moses said, the day you decide to have a king in Deuteronomy 17, make sure he is not a tyrant. Ensure that he is a servant king. A servant king and then they got Saul. And Saul was the exact opposite. We are coming to that in a short while. Eventually, they found David a man after God's heart. That is a king that fitted Moses' recommendation in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Who was able to teach them the law, practice the law, and he wasn't that perfect guy. But he followed God's perfect plan. He wasn't that perfect guy, but he followed God's perfect plan. God never uses the perfect guy for his perfect plan. But where you find an imperfect guy sincerely following God, he will fit into his perfect plan. Let me repeat again. God never uses the perfect guy for his perfect plan. But where you find an imperfect guy sincerely following God, he will fit into God's perfect plan. So he gave them direction. Another word here is the word skillfulness of his hand. Talking about David. By the skillfulness of his hands. Now, the word skillfulness, he directed them by the skillfulness. Empower City, please listen to me, all citizens all over the world. All the pastors, all the district pastors, campuses, leaders, house church pastors, and of course pastors that are here, pastors that are watching online and on television, and every one of you that is involved in raising disciples, and even the disciples who are potential leaders, hear this. The skillfulness there, the word tebuna in the Hebrew, has to do with the wisdom 
you acquire by experience. The skillfulness, the word tebuna, has to do with the wisdom that you acquire by experience. Because leadership is by experience. You don't lead by knowledge alone. You lead by experience. You must have the experience because it's critical. Experience is critical. You must have the experience of one who is learning to teach others. Of one who is learning to teach others. You must have the experience of one under authority to execute one. Because leadership comes with experience. Leadership comes with experience. He said he led them by the skillfulness. The word skillfulness is not just knowledge. Skillfulness is the expertise you get by applying knowledge. Skillfulness is the expertise you get by applying knowledge. That is how he became the good shepherd of the sheep. And you know Moses is equally like that. In Exodus chapter 2, in Exodus chapter 3, you'll find that Moses is equally a shepherd over the people of God. What it means is that God or the scripture treats God's people as sheep. God treats his people as sheep. And sheep must be led. Sheep must be led. Sheep must be tended. Sheep must be attended to. And sheep must be taken care of. God treats his people by his word as sheep. And sheep must be led. Sheep must be tended. Sheep must be attended to. And sheep must be taken care of. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, there is something about faithful men. Because faithful men will be found doing the same thing. Saul had done the number on Samuel. And so Samuel goes to the house of Jesse to anoint a king. Now, please observe something here. God doesn't give Samuel the name of the king. But Samuel is going to anoint a king. But Samuel doesn't have the name of a king. But Samuel knows that there is a king somewhere in the house of Jesse. So, Samuel goes there. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 1, see how it works. 1 Samuel 16 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. He goes in there. He says, Jesse, somehow God has decided to choose one of the members of your Bible school. Somehow God has decided to choose one of your disciples. One of your members who is studious in your Bible school. Those people who buy your books and study very diligently. Those who show up on social media with, with your messages and engages others to listen so he said come in let's see so he brings in the eldest Eliab one who is tallest and has the greatest popularity the pastor in verse 6 look at it verse 6 of first Samuel 16 <clears throat> and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said surely the Lord's anointed is before him he says this is the man before me is the Lord's anointed. And the Lord said to him in verse 7 of First Samuel 16, verse number 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Don't be moved by his popularity because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Ministry is of the heart. Ministry is not in looks. Ministry is in the condition of a man's heart. You can look the part, but not have the part. I mean the heart. 
But somebody may not look like a minister, but has the heart. It's a heart thing. You know, um, I had uh, Benny Hinn many years ago say, you know, he said to Pastor Ray McCauley, far back in the 80s, he said he believes that God gives to pastors a very special heart. Pastors. Because pastors have dealings with members. So God gives them a very special heart. I think so myself. You know, I think so myself. God gives them a very special heart. Now, God said, I have refused him. You are looking at the outward appearance, but I'm looking at the heart condition. I'm looking at his heart. I have refused him. Now, just the next chapter will tell you the kind of person Eliab is. The word refused there in Hebrew has to do with disqualified. He is disqualified. And you know, there are people who are disqualified way ahead of time. Way ahead of time. From the time they start discipleship, their behavior, their heart condition, their motives, they are already disqualified for ministry. That's why some people all their life in church, they never are able to do ministry. Always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because their heart is not right. Their heart condition, their motives, their intentions, what they are looking for is not what God is looking for. Their heart a minister of the gospel is as successful as the state of his heart where ministry is concerned. Is as successful as the state of his heart where ministry is concerned. Are we still in the house? Where ministry is concerned. So he says he is not the guy. And that's strange because culturally the firstborn is the person to choose. Then they called all the children. And the Lord said, neither have I chosen all of them. Now look at verse 10 to 11 of First Samuel chapter 16. Verse 10 to 11. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord had not chosen this. And Samuel said unto Jesse, I hear all thy children. And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. That's a word to underline. Behold, he is the youngest, but he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come to down. Send and fetch him. They asked Jesse, Is this everyone? Jesse says, These are the ones that people recognize. They are on Facebook, they are the ones that are on television. Then he says, oh, there's one. Behold, he keepeth fish. I mean sheep. He's the youngest. But he keepeth sheep. Somehow, Samuel, you know, sometimes when you have that impression of the spirit, some things will just buzz. When he heard that the young man keepeth sheep, he said, that's the one. And we will not sit down. Because when I see a man that has the potential for ministry, when I talk with him five minutes, I can tell. A man that even if you drag him into ministry will not do anything. I can tell. I mean, I can tell. You don't need to close your eyes. Especially if you've been around. You don't need to fast. <laughs> you don't need to pray. I don't need to, uh, to jerk and say, Dost say the Lord. I can just look at you, engage you in a five minutes discourse. And I can tell you whether you can, you're ready for ministry or not. He said, that's the one. If this guy is keeping sheep. And he's the youngest. That's the one. Then he says, we will not sit down till he comes. So, he keeps the sheep. Go get him. That's our man. He knew that he had something we need for Israel. He kept the sheep. The leader of Israel, Moses knew who the keepers of the people were. You know, God says, select 70 men. I will take off your spirit and put on him. And, and Moses knew. In Acts chapter 6, choose ye out among you, honest men, full of the Holy Ghost and of good report. And they pointed them out. It's in any fellowship, in any campus, in any church. All you need is just be observant. You can pinpoint people that are potentials to, to, to be leaders and pastors. It shows. You can't have the potential and it's hidden. It will show your commitment your sense of responsibility, how you are there on time, how you attend to people, how you respond to people, how you are engaged in people, 
how you are you you say brother not looking happy you walk up to him you give him a word of encouragement you grab somebody who needs prayer you pray for him you're all over the place you are interested you know service is over pastor is still standing by the pulpit to attend to people you don't just walk away you, those that have potential for ministry they hang around because more is caught than taught more is caught than taught they hang around they watch the man of god they see how he talks they see how he prays sometimes they even come close to hear what the people are saying and the kind of answer he is giving sometimes they're even ready to stay with him and join him to pray for people because those are the experiences of ministry those that don't have any potential for ministry they are not interested they are not interested the only thing they're interested in is that brother came with a big car let me collect his complimentary card they want to follow people out and see which car he brought which car she brought that may be a potential person that may give me contract or contact or introduce me that's all they're interested it shows where their heart is but those that have potential for ministry they want to hang around the man of God. They want to check how he does what he does. Sometimes they ask questions. Nobody appointed them. They appoint themselves. They want to come around. You see them hanging around. The pastor is telling them, go home. They say, no, sir. When you leave, we will leave. Not that they have any appointment. Not that they have any responsibility. They are learning ministry. But those who are not interested, even when you tell them, hang around. Okay, one, two, three, please hang around. Leaders, come and hang around. They are not interested. No potential for ministry. They are not ready. There's no preparation. There's no desire. They are not coveting the things of the spirit. Such people can grow. Only people that are coveting the things of the spirit can tap in and grow. Because more is caught than taught. It's not everything we teach. There are things you just watch and you learn. Are we teaching here? Like the young man who went to cast out demons, closed his eye, they, they took out the eye for him. If he has been hanging around when we did deliverance, he will have observed how we cast out demons. He will have observed how we get people born again. He will have observed how we respond to people who have situations. Because you have to learn. It's called internship. It's called discipleship. Sometimes we even tell some pastors, hang around, I want to talk to the first timers. They walk away. You have to run around and be looking for it. There's, there's no fire. There's no zeal. It's like we're just forcing them to do ministry. And then when new people come who have fire, we remove them and put new people. They start murmuring. May, may, may you not murmur because if you murmur, you'll be in another trouble. You have all the opportunity to learn. Every Sunday I stand here and I minister. After service, I hang around. I talk to people. I pray for people. I counsel people. I hang around. I hang around. And there's no restriction to anybody from hanging around with me. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I hang around. I pray for people. I talk to people. I respond to people. Sometimes if you're even around, if I want to talk to somebody like we did last night, I'll say, come, 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 come. Let's talk to this person. Because I want you to observe what I'm about to do. I want you to see the way I will answer. I want you to see the way I will respond. Because I'm training. I'm a trainer. I love training people. I'm always carrying people with me because I, at every opportunity, I want to transfer knowledge. I want to transfer experience. I don't hold. I'm not a selfish person. I want to share my life with people that, that value it and are willing to learn. Not on serious people. You hang around me for 10 years. You can't even pray for the sick. What an unserious human being you are. You hang around me for 5 years. You can't even do ministry. You, you are not serious. You are the type that God will tell Samuel. I have refused him. I have refused this one. I have refused him. Because he's not serious. He's not serious. He's not serious. Because if he's serious, his attitude will show. <laughs> he said, I have refused him. In Acts chapter 6, he said, choose those you know, because he shows. He keeps the sheep. He's the youngest. <laughs> I thought the youngest would be in the field playing with other children. I thought the youngest would be in the field playing football. No, the youngest became responsible. He's the one that hangs around. He wants to always be where ministry is happening. 
so he can learn. He wants to always be where ministry is happening so he can observe, so he can engage. When I was learning ministry, when I was growing up, every opportunity to see people minister, even if, I, even if they want me to pay, if I had the money, I'm willing to pay. I'm, I was so inquisitive. If I see a man of God, I'll just be asking questions. I'll just be asking questions. Every man of God I came across, I will stop. I will say, please, man of God, I have a few questions. No man of God passed me by without me collecting something from them. And if they are doing something, I will hang around. If they need help, I will give. I will carry briefcase. I will carry their handbag. Because that's the only reason why I have to be there. I see young men of today. No drive. No drive. No fire, no hunger. No, no zeal. <laughs> Ministry is not magic. Ministry is no magic. You don't want to serve. You have no future in the ministry. This boy ought to be around playing with his friends. He's a young man. He has elder brothers. But yet, he's the youngest that is responsible and looking after sheep. He's going to use you because you are responsible. That's the only reason why God will use you. Not because you have the height. Not because you have the shape. Not because you can speak good English. Not because you are very eloquent. It's because you are responsible. He keepeth sheep. That resonated even though it was insignificant. But Samuel knew that is it. That's the sign we are looking for. As soon as David came in, God said, arise. Anoint him. This is he. Uh, arise. Does God reject people not for salvation, but for ministry? Yes. Capital Y-E-S. He does not reject people for salvation, but he rejects people for service. He rejects people for ministry. That's why Paul said, I put my body under. That after preaching to others, I won't be disqualified from reward. Yes, God rejects people from service. You have to be qualified. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 to 13. Those are qualifications for a man that will be a pastor or a bishop. You have to be what God wants. In Acts chapter 6, they didn't choose everybody. They chose selected people. In salvation, come as you are. In leadership, no, you can't come as you are. You select, you choose. In 1 Samuel 17, it comes out what he was doing. Look at it, 1 Samuel 17 verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse number 12. Now, David was a son that the Ephratite of Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went out among for an old man in the days of Saul. So David is the youngest. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 of the same chapter. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. When you are faithful, you are faithful. When you are not faithful, you are not faithful. A great man of God said, and I agree with him. Great men are revealed in little things. Little men are revealed in great things. Great men are revealed in little things. Little men are revealed in great things. If you want to know a great man, you will see how faithful he is in little, little things. Little, little things. You want to see a small man. He's looking for the pulpit when he has not learned to clean the chair. He's looking for the microphone when he has not learned how to attend prayer meeting. He's looking for limelight when he cannot even explain John 3.16. He's looking for popularity. He can't explain scripture. He's already having channel on YouTube where he's preaching. Meanwhile, he has not served he has not understood it. He has not been discipled. Yet he wants to own a channel to be preaching. He wants popularity. He wants limelight. You don't look for limelight until you are prepared for it. Because nothing destroys men of God fast like limelight. 
When you're not prepared for it, it will be your greatest undoing. Give a faithful man an insignificant work. He will do it very well. Give an unfaithful man a big work. You will regret why you gave him that work. He will bring it down. There's nothing too small when you are faithful. There's nothing too small when you're faithful. I'm committed today as I were when I didn't even have much light. When I had few people. I prayed and studied faithfully and worked faithfully with the little light I had. With the little light I had when I was starting ministry newly, the little light that was available, there were no people like me to teach me. There were no people like me to teach me. You, you think 30 years ago, if I had somebody teach me what I'm teaching you today, hmm, they were not there. So we were doing trial and error. We will push, we will stumble, we will fall, we will stagger, we will stand up. We, 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 we navigated our way through the dark to get to where we got to. You, you have the privilege of me. I'm even giving you more than you can chew per time. I'm pushing. You have no excuse. You have no excuse. Oh yeah. You have no excuse. <laughs> you don't become faithful overnight. You become faithful in little things. And it's over time. It's over time. You can't be faithful... If you can't be faithful raising a disciple. You can't be faithful in Bible study. You can't be faithful in prayer meeting. You can't be faithful in evangelism. <laughs> How will you be able to handle complex theological issues? How? David went back to sheep. They just anointed him. David has just been anointed a king. Yet, he went back to the sheep. That's a faithful man. He didn't start printing complimentary card with his new title. He went back to the ship. The same thing I was doing that brought me this recognition is what I keep doing. I don't stop. Huh? In fact, I do it now with increased dedication, with increased sacrifice. Then he went back to ship, went back to his house church, and went back on time. Cleaned the place before service. Open the place for people to come. Let in the prayer meeting. No matter the anointing, nothing changed in his commitment to service. Talking about David. What else? Look at verse 17. See what David did. In verse 17 of that same chapter. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. He sent him just like Peter, James, and John. He is now carrying food. Why? Because the leader of God's children is a servant. The leader of God's children is a servant. If you can't serve, you can't lead. If service is beneath you, then leadership is way, 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 way too far from you. If service is beneath you, then leadership is way, way, way too far from you. You should be able to serve. So David goes. He takes the food there. <laughs> and look at verse 20, the confrontation. Verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. He left the sheep with a keeper. That's something to underline. He left the sheep with a keeper. And took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight. And shouted for the battle. He left with a keeper. Very faithful. He didn't just leave the ship and say after all I have been sent. No, he made sure the ship was well taken care of by somebody in his absence. That's a responsible person. That's a responsible person. So when you hear he led with the integrity of his heart. This is just the background of that integrity. He has the experience of a faithful man. He knows how to keep the sheep of God. By knowing how to keep the insignificant things. Sheep. If you do not know how to clean the venue for fellowship. How to clean the place for people to sit. 
then you don't love those who are coming to the service. You don't love them. <laughs> if, you can't, if you don't know how to go there, clean the place so that when they come, they can be comfortable. Then you don't love the people of God. You don't love them. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Teaching good? You want to reach the world, but you cannot serve the immediate brethren. Are you not a hypocrite? You are too busy. You are too engaged. <laughs> you are just a joker. Some of us are in a hurry, hurry to laugh at a man of God who has been in ministry for 40 years, 50 years, 45 years. Meanwhile, you cannot be faithful for four weeks consistently. You can't even be faithful consistently for four weeks. But you're in a hurry to laugh at a man of God that has been doing this thing through thick and thin, tough and rough, hard and easy, all. He's been through all manner of weather and yet he's still pushing after 45 years. And you say he doesn't have doctrine. Carry your doctrine and get out. What doctrine? This man labors for 40 years. You, you, with all your doctrine, you can't be faithful for four weeks. You're full of excuses, yet you have doctrine. Take your doctrine and go with it somewhere. The man may not have doctrine, but the man is faithful. He's faithful with the little he knows. And he's doing it well. That's what Jesus will reward. The man has been doing it. He's still doing it. And he's consistent. <laughs> you must be faithful. Jesus said faithful in little will make you a ruler over much. David goes to the field and he decides to take care of Goliath. Now, Look at 1 Samuel 17, 28. <clears throat> Pay attention. 17, 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Underline those few sheep in the wilderness. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come that thou mayest see the battle. Look at the way he spoke about his father's work. Look at the way Eliab spoke about his father's work. Already it reveals the content of his heart. Look at the kind of disdain that he used in describing his father's work. Who did you leave that few sheep? That small church. Those few members. He disdained his father's work. When you see people like this, they are like Esau. They talk down on their inheritance. Esau was called a profane man. A profane man is a man of no value. He was given to profanity. He had no value for spiritual things. He had no honor for sacred things. He called his entire father's inheritance for them. Few sheep. Who did you leave that few sheep with? With disdain and mockery. See his heart. That's why he was refused. See his heart. That's why he was refused. <laughs> Talk down on what their dad does. Spoke in disdain. Such people are rejected. Members of Power City, listen to me carefully. No matter your anger, I know you should not be angry. But even if by mistake, anger takes hold of you, don't say the wrong things. Don't ever say the wrong thing. It will catch up with you. Don't ever. I am telling you, don't say stupid things. Anything you disrespect, you have signed it off from your life. It doesn't matter how you are feeling when you threw the disrespect. There's no excuse for dishonor. Oh, I, I was angry now. I didn't like the way that man of God behaved now. That's why I just spoke like that. There is no excuse for dishonor. No matter how angry you are, you must know where not to be angry. You must know where not to be angry. How can you call it a few sheep? This is a man without honor. 
a man without respect for holy things. And he shows up in the basic things. Esau said, what is it with my birthright? Who cares about birthright? Birthright. Who cares about being a leader in church? Who cares about being in the prayer team? Who cares about preaching and teaching? Who cares about ministry? I just want to eat the word of God and be fine. If they don't allow me to serve, it doesn't matter. You are Esau. Profanity. A man of no value. A man of no respect. No regard. I can't kill myself over ministry. I can't kill myself over anybody. <laughs> then God is not going to trust you with responsibility. Because he killed himself over the same people you can't kill yourself for. He killed himself for them. He gave up himself. Let nobody just come here and be strangulating me. Let nobody choke me. I have my own life to live. And such people don't serve. Nobody should come to my house. So I just bought a new rug. All this one, Papa is talking about house churches. I don't, nobody should come to my house. It's a new rug. Because this rug now, before you know it, as they are coming and going, coming and going, it will be old. Nobody should come to my house. Rug. Rug. The poverty in your family is still warming up. Rug. <laughs> rug. Just rug. Rug. Because you bought rug. Brethren cannot come and fellowship in your house. Rug. 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 Rock carpet. Carpet. When brethren are coming, remove your shoe, remove your shoe, remove. Ah, ah. Rug. Rug. Holy ground. We should remove our shoe for holy ground. You have a long way. You have a long way to go. People that Jesus shed his blood for cannot enter your house because of rug. <laughs> David did exactly what I would have done. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And some of us will turn to our spouses because of a little domestic argument. And every time there's a small argument in that, and you say you are a pastor. And you say you are a pastor. Madam, be careful. Be careful. Don't use the call of God on a man to be taking advantage of him. Don't. Respect holy things. Respect what God respects. Honor what God honors. You say, hey, pastor, pastor nonsense. <laughs> Madam, you're crazy. You're very crazy. No matter what happens, Watch what you say. David said to Eliab, when Eliab was saying, few sheep, few sheep, David said, ah, ah, is there not a cause? David ignored him and turned to another person. Hear me well, everybody. If people bring railing accusation against you, don't engage them. The best answer to accusation is ignore. Ignore. Don't answer them. Don't answer them. Tell them I'm too busy. I can't come down. I'm too busy. I have work to do. Because once you engage them, you're distracted. Don't engage them. Just ignore. That's what I do. I just simply go. I have work to do. Somebody was prophesying that I will go to the bush and all kinds of things. I didn't see the video. I'm too busy to see such things. It's people that brought it and called my attention. To it. And up till today, I have not watched the video. I have not watched it. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. Watch. 
what a man that is not thinking straight is saying, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Huh? When people are engaging you in useless things, tell them, I'm too busy. Keep your eyes on the ball. Keep your eyes on the ball. Tell them, I have work to do. I have the nations of the earth to reach. I have you to pastor. I have you to teach. I have you to be there for. Because all of you too are there for me. I have you to pray for. Eliab turned and moved. I mean, yeah, David turned and moved. He got Goliath down eventually. But observe what happened. First Samuel 17, when he got to Saul, and Saul said, I am going to help you take out Goliath. I mean, and David said to Saul, I'm going to help you take out Goliath. Saul said to David, how do I know you are able? Look at verse 33. See what Saul told David. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. <laughs> uh, when they said someone would take down Goliath, uh, Saul was excited. He thought a very serious person was coming. <laughs> then he saw a youth. <laughs> uh, he comes there and says, is it this David? <laughs> this David that plays the harp? He's a musician. He's not a serious guy. He plays his instrument. <laughs> He's just joking. David, don't do comedy around me. This is a serious matter. <laughs> he doesn't know that there was, there was silent training time. There are people that God is training quietly. Quietly. You are not aware of what's going on. And one day they come out. You think they are just coming out. They've been in the training field. However, in hidden corners. The great men that God is raising all over the world that are undergoing training and they are not playing. They are building. They are developing. Their day of showing forth is surely coming. There is a day. Uh, there's training going on. Then he said to him, are you able to? Are you able to take Goliath when he saw that David was serious? Look at verse 34. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at verse 34 of that same chapter. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear. And I took a lamb out of the flock. I've been in practice. I'm not just a fresher. I've been in the bush. I've been where nobody saw me. Nobody watched my video. Nobody heard my voice. Nobody heard my message. Nobody heard me. Nobody knew what was going on. I've been in silent training and preparation. And even in my training moments, things like Goliath came and I took care of them. That's why this one is a joker. There's nothing. I've been. I've been around. I've been around. I took a lamb and a bear. Look at verse 34. Verse 34 of that same chapter. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. He's about to lead not by chance. This is a guy who is about to lead by experience. I've been around. I may not be pop popular. I may not be on the front lines of the newspapers. But I've been around. And when the chips are down, you know how long we've been around. You know how long this training has been going on. Paul will say to Timothy, do not choose a bishop who has no experience. Don't choose a bishop, a pastor. A novice cannot be a pastor. First Timothy 3 6. A novice. First Timothy 3 6. Not a novice. Less being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. The word novice in the Greek is the word neophytios. Neophytios. N E O P H E T E O S. Neophytios. He is just an overnight. It means somebody who just sprang out. No training, nothing. He just appeared overnight. And you know, overnight ministers, they collapse overnight. <laughs> People ask me, Dr. Damina, where do you get your stamina from? 
What kind of food are you eating? What kind of vitamins are you taking? You preach with short stamina. It's like you never get tired. Do you know where I'm coming from? <laughs> this is a man that will preach crusade without equipments. And the crowd, wherever they are standing, they will hear my voice. This voice has been under training for decades. So, preaching of one, two hours is nothing to this voice. It's training. It's training. And we say, you preach with a lot of energy. Do you know how I pray? For hours. We pray for hours. Sweat will fill the whole floor as if rain fell. They will mop the place because of sweat. <laughs> and it's not one year, not two years, not ten years. Not fifteen years, not twenty years. Not twenty-five. We've been on this thing. You lead by experience. And this experience, you don't buy it in the market. If you don't have it, you don't have it. The only way to have the experience is to go through. That's the only way. You have to go through. And many people don't want that going through. So if you can't go through, you can't get to. You have to go through to get to. There are no shortcuts. There are no, there are no cutting of corners. There are no cutting of corners. Am I teaching good tonight? No cutting of corners. Listen carefully, everybody. No serious leader will trust anybody that just sprang up accidentally. No serious leader. <laughs> no serious leader. <laughs> eh, eh, Pastor Ray, I have met senior men of God around the world. Some of them have given me their pulpit to preach. Some of them never met me before. The moment I meet them for the first time, maybe somebody recommended and they invited me to their church. The moment we meet, before they take me to their pulpit in the office, the first question is, how long have you been in ministry? First question. They want to know. They want to know this man that has come. How much experience does he have to handle my audience? Second question. How is your wife? How many children do you have? Second question. Once I answer those two questions, they will give me something to drink. We'll be ready for service in a few minutes. Let me just check what's going on in the or, or in congregation. He has already gotten what he needs. Every time you meet a senior experienced minister, the first thing they will ask you is, how long have you been in ministry? That's the first question. They are not interested in your epignosis. They want to know if you have the experience to handle their congregation. No, no, no serious minister will trust a fly by night. You know what a fly by night is? Someone just, who just appeared. No history. No history. No, you can't trace where he was trained. You can't find where he came from. You can't find, find who he served. You can't find where he served. Nobody to give him recommendation. You know, you can't trust him. Even in the secular world, when you apply for a job, they'll ask you for references. References means we want to know where you're coming from. And we want to know your history. Ministry is not exempted from it. It's not. He is saved. He has served. Those are the two recommendations. He is saved. He has served. Like Timothy. Joshua ministered with Moses. He has been there. He was there when the church started. He has been there. And he is still there consistent and committed on fire. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 4. Who comforted us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort them. Which are in any trouble. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. It is what God has used to help us. That we will use to help others. There is no fly by night in this thing. It takes consistency of years. As you grow in leadership, all your experiences will become useful. I said it the other day. The good, the bad, the ugly. Today's learning. Today's learning experience for me. In two years time, I will use the experience of today. In two years time. To keep leading God's people. You don't drop the ball. No matter the challenge. 
Because the seeming challenges you have eventually become useful in ministry. In discipleship, you acquire deep experience with the Lord. You serve, then you can lead others as a servant, not as a ruler. You serve, then you can lead others as a servant, not as a ruler. So take note of this. Number one, faithfulness is never in the past. I used to be faithful. I used to be faithful. Faithfulness is never in the past. Number two, humility is never in the past. Anyone can be humble when they are young or when they are poor or don't have anything to boast of. It is natural to be humble when you don't have anything. The true test of your humility is when you start having money. You start having position. You start having recognition. Will you still be humble enough to clean the toilet? Will you still come early and clean the toilet? A friend of mine, Pastor Chris Okoti in Lagos. A few years ago, a number of years ago actually, first time I was meeting him in Lagos. Years ago, Chris Okoti. I got to Lagos. I wanted to meet him. I li- I've always liked Chris Okoti. Even before he became a preacher. I've always liked him. You know, there are people you just like. If anybody abuse them, you can even beat him because you just like them. And no matter what they do, you like them. Case closed. That's how I like him. <laughs> so I went to Lagos. And then somebody who knows me in a quiet bone was close to him suddenly came into the office and said, ah, pastor, you're here. He went up and told Pastor Chris Okote, my pastor in a quiet bone is here. He wants to meet you. So Chris Okote said, bring him up. So I got up, we met with Chris Okote and then we chatted, we chatted, we chatted and we started developing relationship. So that same evening, he now said to me, can we go down to the sanctuary? I said, why not? I came to just spend time with you and just fellowship. So I followed him down to the sanctuary. Look at cars parked. Cars. I mean, when you hear cars, serious cars in different classes, rates and sizes, all lined up as if it was a car mart. Lined up in front of the church. So I said to him, is there service today? He said, no, it's the ushers that have come to clean the church. I said, excuse me, the ushers have these cars? He said, yes, our ushers are MDs, CEOs of companies. Those are the people cleaning the church. I said, okay, I'm hearing. (laughs) I'm learning something. CEOs, managing directors, were the people cleaning and washing the church. And when we entered, see the way they were all on their shorts, with their t-shirts, some of them carrying brooms and buckets. These are people that have staff in their companies coming to the church to clean it by themselves. Some people will pay people to go and do it. When you grow to where you are using money, instead of using the same hands that you were using when you were nobody, something is going wrong with your mind. They were all over the place, sweeping, cleaning with their buckets. I stood and became more humble than ever. Uh -uh. These are ushers. It's not a world congress. It's not a United Nations occasion. These are just ushers. That was enough preaching for me. Humility is not what you used to do. Faithfulness is not what you used to do. Same thing with loyalty. Loyalty is not in the past. It is what you are still doing now. So we find that David is a faithful guy. Faithful with few. You can see the sheep. It was not really a big farm. It was a small farm. The brother called it few sheep. So there must have been few. Few members. Small church. You must carry your disciples. You must carry your disciples and treat them like gold. No matter how many they are. You treat them like gold. Because that is your heart state. When there's pain on them, there's pain on you. When they cry, you cry. When they're in trouble, you're praying. Just be faithful. Teaching the word. I have seen people abandon their flock. When there's a problem, the pastor takes off. 
He has never been able to pastor many things for years. You shouldn't be like that. Don't ever treat God's sheep like nothing. Faithfulness is never in the past. Humility is never in the past. Loyalty is never in the past. So as you are a disciple, you also are going to grow in experience. As a disciple, you're also growing. Make sure that your experience becomes useful for others. How can that happen? The only way that can happen is if you don't drop the ball. Stay focused. You will have the expected experiences. You will have difficulties. It's normal. You will have difficulties. But don't drop the ball. You will be tempted to feel like giving up. Hold on. If you hold on just a little, you will find out that somehow, somehow, strength will be supplied. When you feel like you can't take it anymore, stand there and hold on. We are not of day that draw back. We are of day that press forward to the saving of the soul. Teaching good tonight? Yeah. We stay with it. We stay with it. Then somewhere along the line, what seemed like trouble will now become comfort unto others. I have had people say, your teaching has brought me life. Your teaching has helped me to stay in ministry. I've had ministers say to me, it is when I started hearing your teaching now that Christianity is becoming meaningful. I am wondering, what if I didn't stay? What if I gave up? When all hell broke loose? What if I quitted? When it was tough to go on. What if I surrendered? When it was like nobody was on my side. But I held on and I pressed on. Pressing up the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. I'm pressing on to higher ground. Lord plant my feet on higher ground. I'm pressing on. Brother Paul said this one thing I do. I forget the past. I press forward was the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I forget the past. I see people today blessed by my ministry all over the world. Supposing I gave up 10 years ago. Supposing I gave up 15 years ago. Supposing I quitted. Where was I? Somebody said to me, I don't know where it was. Somebody said to me, Papa, anytime you ever feel like giving up, remember me. I need you. You can't give up. Anytime you feel like giving up my life, think about my life, please, and hold on some more. I told him, me, <laughs> if I was going to give up, it would have been long ago. The bridges that I would have used to go back, they are all burnt. There's no more bridge, so there's no going back. This journey is to the end. Kabayada. We are not of day that draw back. We have did that press forward. I trust God to abide. I trust God to help me. I trust God to keep me. I trust him. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. Brother Paul will say to Timothy. The things that you have heard of me. Among many witnesses the same. Commit thou to faithful men. Who shall be able to teach others also. So be faithful with the teaching. What we are teaching you, take it serious. Because that is one of the things you will commit to people. The things you have heard. The teachings you have heard. Look at Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Brother Paul said to Titus, Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine. Both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Holding fast the faithful word. That is, he understands the faithful word and he is able to teach others. You hold fast that faithful word. You haven't seen us teach anything else. Even under the pandemic, I was coming here and I kept teaching the same thing. I didn't change the texture of my message to fit into the pandemic. Where the message is concerned, the pandemic does not exist. We kept teaching the same thing. In and out of season, we are holding fast 
to the form of faithful words which you have received. We do not preach to suit people. We preach the same thing. You are the one that will look for how to fit in. Be faithful with the teaching. We will never compromise it. Because we have the faithful word. The faithful word requires a faithful minister. The faithful word requires a faithful minister. Can you say with me very loud, every one of you, I am faithful. Whether your pastor is there or not, you must make up your mind to be faithful. Faithful simply means be loyal to what you are called to do and do it well. Be loyal to what you are called to do and do it well. He is faithful with the teaching. He is faithful with the purpose. Two things. He is faithful with the teaching. He is faithful with the purpose. Paul will say to Timothy, you know my purpose. You know it. Second Timothy 3.10. Paul will say to Timothy, you know my purpose. 3.10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, Charity, patience. You know my purpose. That word purpose is the Greek word protheistis. Protheistis. P-R-O-T-H-E-S-T-I-S. It means my dedication. You know what I am dedicated to. You know the reason why I do it. In other words, as we rub off on each other, we pick purpose from each other. We pick purpose from each other. I am not really trying to do something new. God, what do you want me to do? A sense of purpose. Doing it for the same reason God wants you to do it. We learn purpose from each other. We learn the word and ministry from others. We also learn purpose from others. So in discipleship, as you lead men in Christ, write these things down quickly, quickly, quickly. Number one. You lead men in prayer. You lead men in prayer. Number two. You lead men in the workings of the spirit. You lead men in prayer. You lead men in the workings of the spirit. Number three. You lead men through commitment. In commitment. You lead them in commitment. That extra push will bless somebody's life. Somewhere, that extra staying power. That extra staying power is going to be somebody's saving grace. People are looking up to you. You must make sure you don't drop the ball. Number three, you lead people in learning discipleship. I mean number four. No, number one, you lead them in prayer. Number two, you lead them in the workings of the spirit. Number three, you lead them in commitment. Number four, you learn discipleship from people. You learn discipleship from people. Number five, I mean number four. Number five, you learn morality from people. Morality, the aspect of being sincere. And pure in conduct. Morality. That's number four. Number three, discipleship. I mean number five, morality. Number four, discipleship. Number three, commitment. Number two, workings of the spirit. Number one, prayer. Okay. Number six, you learn generosity. You learn generosity. You learn generosity. Number seven. You learn how to handle sorrow and pain when you serve from others. How to handle sorrow and pain when you serve from others. I'm going to ask you tonight, can, so, can others learn from you these things? Can people just follow you and learn prayer? Learn the workings of the spirit? Can people follow you and learn commitment to the gospel? 
When people come around you, can they understand, can they learn how to disciple people? Can people come around you and learn morality and purity in conduct? Can people just by hanging around you learn generosity? What of when there's pain and sorrow? Can people learn a, one or two things from you? When your expectations are not met, how do you respond? How do you react? You learn it by watching others. When you see the way people handle things, it's easy for you to handle it. There's that call on us to be Joshua, to be David, to be Elisha, to be Timothy, to be Titus. We are learning it. We are not trying to form our own. We are not trying. We are watching and simply replaying what we are learning. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. That's all we are doing. We are not under pressure. So, let's say 1 Thessalonians 5.12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 12. Mm -mm. And we beseech you brethren to know them, know them which labor, labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and admonish you. Know them that labor among you. We beseech you brethren to know. Did he say we beseech you brethren to know all the men of God? What did he say? Know them that labor where? Among you. Some of you don't even know the name of the pastor of Power City, Lagos, Power City, Abuja, Power City, Portacot. But you know the names of 20 men of God in Nigeria. You're a bad example. Very bad example. Your responsibility are the leaders over you in your local church. You need to know them. Those are the ones to know. Those that labor among you. They are over you in the Lord. Which are among you, not in the body of Christ, but among you. You esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Know them. First Peter 4, 5. Peter says, First Peter chapter 4, verse 5. Look at it. Brother Peter is speaking. He says, Who shall give account to him? Give me Second Peter chapter 4, verse 5. Second Peter chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 4 verse 5. Hallelujah. Brother Peter says that there are younger ones and there are elders. So there are pastors over pastors. District pastors over house church pastors. House church pastors over disciples. Recognize the leadership structure. The moment we follow the leader, that's how we achieve unity. By following the leader. This unity starts with two leaders in the same house. Once that happens, there will be dishonor. There will be disunity. And there will be discord. Disunity starts when I dare to be different. <clears throat> I'm trying to be different. I'm already different. I don't have to try. Disunity starts when I don't see just one person over me. When I'm seeing two people over me. That's disunity. Don't make Aaron's mistake. Don't make Aaron's mistake. Aaron always listens to what the congregation wants. The people say, the people say, the people say, that's Aaron's mistake. You have only one person to listen to, your leader. Nobody else. You are not to listen to the people. You have to listen to your leader. That's why Paul said the time will come when they will not want to, when they will not want to tell you what to teach. They will not hear. They will have itching ears. They will go around looking for, you know, 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 3. Time will come. They will not endure sound doctrine. Stay with what I have taught you. Pray and decide to live a life of faithfulness in the house. In all conditions and situations. As you lead others to lead others. Who will lead others? To lead others. Who will lead others? To lead others. To lead others. Who will lead others? To lead others. To lead others. Who will lead others? To lead others. To lead others. Who will lead others? To lead others. And that is the way the legacy of the gospel of Christ keeps going from generation to generation. It takes faithful men. It takes faithful men. 
It takes faithful men. It takes loyal men. It takes dedicated people. It takes people that are focused. It takes people that have made up their minds to stay with the ministry. Through thick and thin, we're here. Yeah. And we're going to push this thing. We're committed to it. We're going to learn it well and teach it well and stay with it. Say, you have known my manner of life. You have known my purpose. You have known my example. You have known my conduct. It's not just the message you learn. You learn other things. You learn the conduct. You learn the manner of life. You learn the purpose. You learn the character. All that is important. That's what breeds success. Are we blessed tonight? Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you tonight. Glory to God. What a week, man. Has it been a great week this week? Let's pray in the spirit as we round up. In the name of Jesus, Father, we praise you. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray for everyone hearing the sound of my voice. In this building, on television, on radio, on social media, in the house churches, in our campuses around the world, and all our Bible study centers. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to teach and to bring clarity from your word, to equip and to build your people as workmen, workmen, laborers, that will labor in the vineyard to make Jesus see the fruit of his labor in men disciples raised all over the world. Lord, I decree that everyone hearing the sound of my voice by the Holy Ghost is being prepared, is being equipped, is being trained, is being empowered. And in the name of Jesus, we rejoice that we will see men raised all over the world through us. Men raised everywhere to preach Christ, to know Christ, to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Worthy ambassadors. Worthy ambassadors. Jacolataba. Men that will stand fast in this ministry in and out of season. That will not be deterred by anything. Thank you father. Hallelujah. And I decree and declare tonight in the name of Jesus. That anyone that is hearing the sound of my voice tonight. That was getting tempted to quit or to give up. I command him fired up. In the name of Jesus. Satan stop that. In the name of Jesus. Agaba, Shokolo, Namana, Koroto, Sakala. You're strengthened with might. By the spirit in the inner man. And in the name of Jesus. You're fired up. Legajogodo, Mabarakata, Magalinema, Hengebo, Zokolo, Barakata. Thank you father. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keeps your heart and mind. And I pray for anyone that is sick out there. Be healed. Be healed. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the blessing. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory. Glory. What a service, man. Now listen, I want to take up your offerings quickly. We give in faith. We give in honor of Christ. We give in honor of Christ's finished work. We give in honor of our collective assignment to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping believers to know who they are in Christ, what they have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. Every time you give to this ministry, what you are saying is that this vision has to get to the ends of the earth. And we want you to know we appreciate you. Now remember, this Sunday is going to be Partnership Sunday for all partners of this ministry worldwide. You know, once every month is Partnership Sunday where we give all the partners and friends of this ministry an opportunity to intentionally, deliberately give into this ministry what they have proposed in their heart to support this ministry to help us meet up with all the budgets and keep this gospel going on all over the world. And I want to thank all of you partners. I want to thank all of your friends. We look forward to an exciting Sunday service together this coming Sunday. It's going to be exciting as we also pray for all of you and believe God for greater things. But I want you to know it's going to be an exciting time this Sunday. Now, I want to pray for your offerings. On TV, banking details are scrolling. On social media, the banking details are there. If you want to do a transfer, the details are there. But I want you to know, every time you give to this ministry in honor of Christ, your giving never goes unrewarded. 
Thank you, Lord. Lift up your offerings, Father. We give in faith, we give with joy, and we thank you for the privilege of honoring your word tonight. And we declare that as your word is going forth around the nations of the earth, we are partakers of the blessing. And through our giving tonight, we honor Christ. And I pray for everybody giving. Your needs are met supernaturally according to his riches in glory. Thank you, Father, for answer prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory to God. I'm going to be joining Mr. Michael Bush in the next one minute. You don't want to go away. You want to stay with us. It's going to be exciting. Tomorrow is Saturday. I'll be teaching here at 6 o'clock. And tomorrow is the day to the last day. Sunday will be the last day of of third season four and i'm already preparing for third season five i'm just preparing i'm informing you ahead of time because there's a lot more to 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 train and to equip you with training never ends till jesus comes so get ready but you know we'll take a break after sunday and do other things before we take another time to do third season five but we love you guys it's been an exciting week looking forward to meeting all of you in the other studio radio audience mr bush will read for you the banking details you know as as we begin ask the counselor and until i see you in the other studio enjoy the grace of christ let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight uh, glory we amen you have been blessed by this message for these all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damino. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.